it's so good to be back with you today. I'm grateful for the opportunity to fill in for Josh. And when Josh called me several weeks ago and told me this exciting news about going to, to uh, Boston area, I was like, Southern boy, Boston? But if you know him, you know he's probably just the right guy to be able to do that. So anyhow, I am delighted to be here once again. I, one of the things that I enjoy about coming with you here to you is y'all are such an easy group to preach to. Did you know that? You really, really are. You appreciate God's word. You appreciate uh, listening. And if I see you nod off, I might throw something at you, you know, but seriously, what a joy it is to be here. And I want to tell you what. He doesn't age, does he? He just gets better with age. Isn't that right? Larry, thank you so much for all you do and that you continue to do. May God continue to rest his hand upon you. If you have your Bibles, I'm going to ask you to turn with me to Joshua. Back in the Old Testament, you get the Pentateuch out of the way. Uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and then what's next? Joshua. So Joshua's the next. And um, uh, we're going to look at chapter 24. I'm going to talk about the bottom line this morning. Joshua chapter 24. You know, several years ago, uh, there was a popular, or pop, I'd call her a pop singer and songwriter by the name of Alanis Morissette. You may know the name. Uh, she was interviewed about her work, and she was asked to describe her music. This was her reply. She said, I sing about truth. And then she said, my truth. Well, when she said my truth, I, I'm thinking to myself, she's bought into the current notion that my truth may not be your truth. And in reality, we have to ask ourselves, does that mean there is no definitive truth? All of it seems to be relative. And maybe it's this mindset that our society has gone into that's produced a culture where life reflects many of these kinds of thoughts. Amen? Amen? especially when it regards spiritual indecision, a search for answers to life's most important questions and problems. Can I pause just for a second? I was supposed to make a formal announcement, and I did not make that announcement. As soon as the service is over, my wife and I are going to kind of sneak on out. I have a granddaughter that's getting baptized right down the road here. Hey, and, and their service starts a little later than ours, and so they're doing it at the end of the service. So God willing, if the preacher's short, we'll get there in time. So anyhow, I just wanted to let you know, if you see us, we're not mad. I just got to go see my daughter get baptized, right? So, granddaughter. All right, now... So these spiritual indecisions to life's problems. And it's not that the United States has never heard of Jesus Christ. Isn't that right? For we certainly have. Probably no nation in the world has been exposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ, to the name of Jesus Christ, through religious broadcasting than good old U.S. of A., right? That name of Jesus is heard daily. But the value system of our society is shifting. And I, let me really rephrase that. I don't think it's shifting. I think it has shifted. Old answers are dismissed. They're unacceptable. And now we have this prevalent uh, air of restlessness, whether it be spiritual restlessness and, 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 and physical restlessness or whatever kind of restlessness it is. It is that same spiritual restlessness that also characterized the final years of Joshua's life. Now, the people of God were not completed with their mission of going in and occupying the promised land. They were almost finished, the promised land, and yet they were restless. And, and some of the people were strong in their faith. You know what I mean. They're strong in their faith. And they were making a difference for God. And, and they were helping to change the culture around them individually. And still others are sold out body and soul to contemporary thoughts. 
whether it was the morals or the practices or somewhere in between the two. And there's a large group of contingencies of um, Israelites, their countrymen, who had made no clear, decisive decision where they stood, especially in relationship to God. It's to this group that Joshua urged them to move beyond indecision, restlessness, to some clear-cut decision for God. Why is it that making the right decisions are more difficult than making wrong decisions? Now, everybody put a mental picture of the, on the map of Mississippi. On the right side, it kind of slants down, and it's a straight arrow, right? On the left side, it, it, it slants down a little bit more, but it's not a straight arrow. What does it look like? It's crooked. Why is it crooked? It's got the Mississippi River, and I'm telling you, it's just like a snake going back and forth. If you blow it up, you can see that. How many of you know uh, what, uh, about Lake Bruin? Anybody? Anybody ever heard of Lake Bruin? Go across uh, Louisiana, and we've stayed over there several times. Uh, we've, we've been afforded a, a place to stay there a few times, taking my family over there, and, it, and it's been wonderful. Well, that is just one big oxbow that meets itself on the other end, and they just cut it off, dammed it up, and made the Mississippi straighter right there. Big old water. Now, let me ask you this. Why is it that water goes like this sometimes? It because, it's because it follows the path of what? Least Resistant. And that's what makes rivers and people crooked, full of sin. Is that a better way of saying it? You follow the path of least resistance. And listen, we make a lot of decisions every day that doesn't make any difference. Whether you had cereal this morning, you had a, had a sausage biscuit, or, or even an apple pie, right? Those are not going to terribly change your life one way or another. But there are decisions in life that are imperative that will impact the rest of your life. And you know, individuals make these decisions in life and they have to live by the consequences of those actions. Joshua begins going over their history, what God has done. And he, he begins with verse 3 of chapter 24. And it's 17 times in rapid fashion, it, it, it seems like it's a machine gun, Joshua shouts aloud for the Lord. I'm going to read several verses here in just a moment. I want you to go ahead and stand with me as we turn to Joshua 24, starting with verse 3. Please stand. I want to honor the Lord with the reading of His Word. Verse 3. I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led him through all the land of Canaan and made his offspring many. I gave him Isaac. Look at verse 4. To Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. Look at verse 5. And I sent Moses and Aaron and I plagued Egypt with what I did in the midst of it and afterward I brought you what? Out. Look at verse 8. Then I brought you to the land of the Amorites who lived on the other side of the Jordan. They fought with you, and I gave them into your hand, and you took possession of their land, and I destroyed them from before you. Drop down to verse 13. I gave you a land on which you had not labored, and cities that you had not built, and you dwell in them. You eat the fruit of vineyards and olive orchards that you did not plant. Pray with us. Father, I thank you for this blessed day, for the opportunity to be before your throne. I pray that you would speak into our hearts today. May the Holy Spirit have his way with us. And may our hearts be softened and receptive to your leading this morning. Bless this body. Speak to us now. For it's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. Now, here's what he's asking. He says, look at the facts. He, he's, he's just gone through this liturgy, and he said, look at the facts, then decide 
No guessing what the primary concern is. To me, it's crystal clear. He wants you to know who the real God is. He says, he's not one with might of swords or even the bow. He says, victory is won otherwise. It is the power of God. And God has done it all, right? And still people have to choose for themselves. They have to choose intellectually. They have to choose decisively. They also have to choose willingly. This is the God who made the heavens and the earth. This is the God that loved you too much to leave you in the condition of sin without giving you a way out. This is the God who demonstrated his love. He sent his only son to earth so that you, he could come and live among you. This is a God who knew you could never earn your way into heaven by good works. Amen? So he went to the cross bearing your sins. This is the God whom the grave could not hold, became victorious, and rose from the grave, right? This is the God who established the church and who is coming back in the form of His Son to bring human history as we know it today to an end. Got that? This is the God that you are called to serve. And today I want to share a two-part decisive directive for us. The first is this. Choose today whom you will serve. Look at the next couple of verses, verses 14 and 15. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Verse 15. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your fathers served in the region beyond the river, the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, and he goes on and on and on. You don't have to guess what Joshua is after here, right? The words, the verb or directives uh, is used seven times in those two verses. Serve. Joshua called for a decision here. He wanted to help end the spiritual, intellectual, moral, if you will, indecisiveness, restlessness of his people that marked so many of them. And Joshua demands a commitment. We need to give him that commitment. And now fear the Lord and serve him wholeheartedly and without reservation. Hundreds of years ago, one of the songs we were singing just a little bit ago, the prophet Elijah was on Mount Carmel. And he gave a similar challenge. It comes out of 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 21. He says, How long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, what? Follow him. There's another translation I want you to listen. I really appreciate this translation. It goes like this. How long will you go limping with two different opinions? How about that? That's pretty strong, isn't it? How long will you go limping through life this or this? Are we going to make a choice or are we just going to Continue to limp through life. Joshua urged them to consider the options. In fact, he even tried to help him. He gave them four different options they could choose from. First of all, he said, you can follow the old gods of Mesopotamia. He says, the gods that your father served beyond the river. Now, what he's referring to here is that Abraham came from Mesopotamia. His people were worshiping the gods there. And that's when God called Abraham. Secondly, he says, if they preferred, they could adopt the gods of the Canaanites. They had spent the last seven years trying to eradicate them, get them out of the land, the land of the uh, 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 milk and honey. And you could serve them. Or the gods in Egypt. They were quite familiar with them, weren't they? How long had they spent in captivity? Anybody can tell me, can my youth tell me? How long had the Israelites spent in captivity? 40 days, a little bit longer than that. How long? How many? Multiply that times 10. 400, right? 
400 years. They certainly would know, right? Those gods there. And then he gave a last option. He said, but if they preferred, they could adopt the God of the Canaanites. Not the Canaanites. The, the real God is what I meant to say. He was still an option. And I think it's amazing what God has done. If you go back and look at the first 13 verses that we were reading through, and I skipped several of them, it would only be reasonable to respond to the waves of God's goodness. I mean, we read verse 13, and it was saying, you're partaking of this, of this area that you didn't do anything to get. They planted the crops. You're, you're getting the rewards from all of this. Huh. So, guess what? That same kind of thought is found in the New Testament. You go to Romans chapter 1, go all the way through uh, chapter 11, and it talks about the goodness that God has done for us. And then you get to chapter 12, and most of you are familiar with this verse. I'm going to read it in an expanded translation. It says, So then, brothers, in view of all of these mercies that God has bestowed on you, I now make this plea. Present your bodies to God. Present them as a sacrifice, a living one, not a lifeless one, a holy one, because it's offered to a holy God, and one in which you will take pleasure. For when you consider your indebtedness to God, the consecration of your lives in His service is your logical act of worship. Right? Here's the application to that. He, he's asking for for four sure, decisive decisions that we need to consider for God. Here's the first. You have to quit straddling the fence. We live in a world where you're around people, and I hope if, if this is you, you need to get off the fence, okay? But we live in a world today where people, are want, during the week, they want to get outside in the world, they want to do what just the world does. Isn't that true? Even at school. Well, they're doing that. I, I, would that be all right? That's not what we do at church. We get to church and we put on a smile and we act like something different, don't we? What he is saying is you can't have a foot in the world and you can't have a foot in, the, in, in God's world and call it compatible because they are not compatible. Right? right? So you have to quit straddling the fence. Part of the reason is that you think it might change your status in the world. And they don't want to give up their sin in order to be right with God. And you know what? Instead, they sit on the fence. Not really part of the world or part of the church. And so Joshua's challenge to us is this, to acknowledge it's time to make a decision. Either you want to enter the world, live by its standards and its rewards, regardless of how temporary it might be, or you need to decide to follow God wholeheartedly. And you do it without any reservation. And you, at some point, you end up having to make a decision. And notice how we tend to respond. Well, I, I want to. That's what people tell me. I've heard it, if I've heard it once, I've heard it a gazillion times. I, I, I'm, I've even heard them say, I'm going to do it one day. And I think, well, what's wrong with today, right? And they say that. And I've come to the conclusion that people that say that don't really want to come to Christ. They either don't see the need for it. You know, when we live in opulence, and I would have thought because of the COVID, people would say, we need God. We need God real bad. But you know what we've done instead? We've learned how to cope. Didn't mean we liked it, did it? But we've learned how to cope. The real answer is Him. Not how to cope. It's Him. So there's never a good time for some to come, and maybe they're just too proud. Or maybe they're somewhere in between those two extremes. They don't want to take the time to even think about it. And I begin to scratch my head and say, what is going on with all this? The second sure decisive, besides straddling the fence, is it has to be a genuine decision. Joshua is now 110 years of age. Can you imagine us living to be 110? Isn't that, wouldn't that be something? But 
he's still leading. He's a soldier hardened from the battle scars. He made a long-term commitment, a choice to follow God. And he didn't take it lightly, lightly, nor was it hell like. If you go back and study the original language, Joshua is using terms here that determined, as Joshua did, and challenged the people to choose God, uh, choose to serve God, and affirmed his choice. It was a settled issue. In fact, the tense that was used means more than a one-time choosing. In other words, if you make a choice, you, you, you can't say, I'm done with it. You ever heard somebody say, well, um, you know, I'm going to join the church. Ha, 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 I'm going to get my fire insurance. What are they saying? They're saying, I don't want to go to hell. So I'll go up there, I'll do the ritual, I'll get baptized. Remember what Jesus said? Part from me for what? I never knew you. It means having a living, live relationship with the Heavenly Father. This tense means it involves the past, it involves the present, and it involves the future. It's something like this. I have chosen to serve the Lord. I am choosing the same path today. And I will still go on choosing to serve God until I draw my very last breath. Okay? To Joshua, serving the Lord was a daily choice that had been decided a long time back. So the second sure decisive decision is genuine decision. And the third is this. You have to stand firm in your faith. It's not a private issue. Sometimes we're not willing to acknowledge him before others. Didn't I say earlier, Matthew 10, 33, but whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is where? In heaven. Listen, I'm not trying to say that you don't belong to Christ. If you don't want to know, let others know. And what I'm talking about, whether you're at home, at work, in a business, whether you're at a social event, you're out playing softball, or you're even at school. Wherever you go, people need to know who you stand for. What do you stand for, right? So the third sure decisive decision is standing firm. Here's the last. You have to follow through with your faith. Follow through with your faith. What Joshua means by that is this. He had led the children to the promised land, and here they had picked up their new religious practices that were among the people. They had mingled with them and, and, and had spread them out with those of the word of God. And he said, you have to make a firm choice. Had to be made now. And for every generation that follows, you must choose between expediency and principle. You must choose between this world and eternity. You must choose between God and anything that will come in between the two. The fourth sure, decisive decision is following through. Now, that is choosing whom you will serve. But choosing whom you will serve influences undergirds the second directive or the second part of the directive. And that is this. Whom you serve influences others. Did you know that? Somebody told me a long, long time ago, and it took me a while to catch on, but your actions, listen, your actions, people are watching you all the time. Young people, hear me when I tell you this. What you do at school, you think, well, nobody saw that. Are you sure? How many times have you seen somebody do something and you said, they didn't see me do that? They, uh, they, uh, they didn't see me watching them. How many times have you said that? How many th times do you think that's happened to you? They saw you doing something. You, you look around, oh, whew, got by without that. Let me tell you something. People are watching. You know what the greatest testimony any of us could have, and that includes adults, 
somebody to come up and say to you, you know what? I don't know what it is about you, but there's something different. I'm glad you asked. And then be bold enough to tell them the reason that you're different. Amen? Be bold enough to do that. Whom you serve influences others. Joshua concludes with one that many of us hold dear. Now, my wife who sang earlier, and I'm just telling you, she's been a songbird ever since I've known her, and nothing has changed. We celebrated 39 years her chasing me yesterday, okay? (laughs) Y'all know how that really is scripted, right? Y'all understand the truth of that. But you know what? She went to China. We've both been to China. We we couldn't go at the same time. I was asked to go with her to China, but we had small children at the time, and it just wasn't feasible. Somebody had to take care of those 22 kids, I mean, four kids. (laughs) It seemed like 22 at the time when I was having to do it by myself, right? And, and, And so I took care of the kids. She went overseas to China. She brought back me this scroll. I meant to bring it this morning. I just simply forgot it. But on that scroll is Joshua 24, 15. Anybody know what it says? But as for me and my house, how do you know that? How do you know that verse? How do you know that? People say, (laughs) well, let me say this. It is one of the most memorable verses that is out there. But it's for me and my house, we will do what? We will serve the Lord. Amen? That statement is a culmination of a life lived in obedience to God and to His Word. And you know something else? There were times when Joshua fell. I'm so glad none of you have ever failed. Right? There were times in Joshua's life when he became discouraged. I'm glad none of you have ever been discouraged, 2020. Do I need to say anything else? Great day, right? It doesn't matter if you're a great leader of God's people or what. We fail. We become discouraged, don't we? But once Joshua committed his life to God. He turned from everything else to following the one true God. And Joshua not only influenced his own household, but also motivated many others to serve the Lord. Now, whether good, bad, or indifferent, our influence always extends beyond our immediate surroundings. You know how I know that? Look at verses 16, 17. Then the people answered, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For it is the Lord our God who brought us and our fathers from this land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, who did those great signs in our sight and preserved us in all the way that we went and among all the peoples through whom we passed. It was done thousands of years ago in the Old Testament. You got that? You're challenged to go forward by a deliberate daily choice to follow Christ. Fearlessly, just as Joshua had done. Listen, it may not make us popular. You got to understand that. But let me tell you what it will do. It will make you powerful as a people of God. And notice how the book of Joshua ends. It ends on a note of affirmation. Look at verse 24. And the people said to Joshua, The Lord our God we will serve, and His voice we will obey. The bottom line is a choice of Israel, and it had long-lasting results. Verse 31, Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua. 
and had known all the work that the Lord did for Israel. Here's the bottom line. This is why it matters even today. There was a lady after church, she asked her husband, can we go by Walmart? You know how we do that silly thing called uh, uh, showers? And they were having a shower Sunday afternoon for an expectant mother. And the lady wanted to go by Walmart and pick up a few things, but especially had to run by and get some diapers for a baby shower. That's what we do, isn't it? You know, they, they, they run out, of, they, they get so many preemies or earlies or whatever, and then they have to give them to a gift to the next pregnant woman because they can't use them all. That's just what we do. Y'all are laughing because it's true. And, and, and this lady picked up a pair of costume earrings. Now, how many have ever done that? Just, I kind of like that. Stuck it in a buggy. They're in a rush. They're in a hurry. I think the thing is at 2 o'clock. They've got to get home, drop the husband off. He, she's got to run back to the church and, and do the baby shower. And, and so this is what they were doing. And, and so she got the earrings, put the stuff in there. There's four, five, six things in there. They put it up there. They checked out. They get out to the car. They're putting it in the trunk. And guess what is there? And there I mean, time is drawing nigh. Do y'all know what I mean? And there the earrings set on the thing. Check the pay, and there's no charge for the earring. Now, get, get with me here. You think Walmart's going to miss a pair of $3.99 earrings? Nah, not at all. Husband said, we got to go if you're going to be there on time. So they got in the car, they went home. A couple of weeks later, they're back into Walmart. You know what they do? They go to the jury section. They pick up a set of earrings just like the ones they'd gotten. They go to the cashier, they check out, and the husband says, here, put these back up. Oh, you don't want these? I said, no. I, I, I said, no, yeah, you're right. I don't want them. I just want you to leave the charge on there. Now, if you want to mess up a girl checking you out, <laughs> you do something like that. And I'm just telling you, the look I got, I, if I could frame that, I'd keep that in my house forever. She was like, are you crazy? I said, no, no, no. I said, you need to charge me for it and go put it back on the shelf. And she's looking around like, we've got an idiot right here on checkout seven, you know. And then I had to explain. We got out of the store in a very fast hurry the other day. Did I say we? Oh, that was us. We got out of the store, and I had to explain that we got out without paying for the jury. He said, well, Brother Zion, that was an honest mistake. Like you said earlier, that's Walmart. What difference does it make? I have raised four children. Just what I told y'all earlier. We were talking about this. I went to a conference in Birmingham this week, and we were talking about this with the other pastor I was with. And people look at you and watch what you do. He has one daughter, and he would tell me a quote from that daughter, and I said, I wonder where she got that from. I wonder where she got that from. What I'm telling you is, you watch your, your parents like a hawk. My children watch us, and they needed to see us do the what? Right thing. Because we belong to the family of God. Amen? All I'm telling you is this. The bottom line is you have to choose today whom you will serve. I want to close. I urge you continuing. Do not continue standing in the middle. Choose yea or nay one way or the other. 
The Apostle Paul described it this way in the church that was made up of the people that were in Revelations in chapter 3, verse 15. He said they were neither hot nor what? In fact, if you want, you, if you want to know what one of the biggest things they had there was he called the people that are neither hot nor cold. Do you remember the term he used? What? Lukewarm. Ah, there's a better term than that. It's called nauseating. True, you can translate it as nauseating. That's what you are if you're standing on the fence trying to straddle the world and straddle the church and say, oh, I'll live both of them. You are absolutely nauseating to the Lord. Now, it's, it's more polite to say lukewarm. Doesn't hurt as much, right? Truth of the matter, a very good translation is nauseating. We're living in an age when just like in the past, God is looking for men, looking for women, looking for youth of fearless faith who will step up, who will step out and accomplish something great for the kingdom of our Lord. And all of God's people said, I love what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. Today, is the day of salvation. How about you? Where are you? Have you been coming to church and saying, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it one day, and you keep putting off? That's because maybe you never intend to do it. I don't know. But if you want to get serious this morning about you and your relationship to the Heavenly Father, you need to step up and step out, right? Step up and step out. And be counted for the Lord. Maybe your heart has been in tune with the Lord, but something has come along and derailed you at the moment. Some little sin has creep, creeped into your life, and I'm just telling you, <laughs> it's just not what it needs to be. Maybe you need to come to the altar and just say, Lord, forgive me. Help me to get this out. Maybe you need to come to the altar and pray for one of your youth. Maybe you need to pray for that neighbor. Maybe you need to pray for that spouse. Maybe you need to pray for that relative who just simply doesn't get it and doesn't want to know Christ. I don't know what you're supposed to do this morning, but I do know this. When you leave and exit those doors or those doors or those doors, you will leave either one of two conditions. You will leave either obedient or what? Disobedient. There's no other way. You know it because it's pounding on your heart right now. You're either going to leave obedient or disobedient. So let's be of the group that is going to be obedient. All God's people said what? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this blessed opportunity we have to be here. And we acknowledge, Father, that sometimes we get off path. But today, Father, I pray that our hearts and lives are lined up exactly where they need to be. And Father, if there's somebody here that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, I pray that they will come to know you. And Father, if there's somebody that needs to come to the altar, for whatever reason, Father, may they do so. Maybe somebody's been church at seeking and searching a church home. Father, what a great and loving group of people this is. Amen. Amen. But whatever it is, Father, help us to leave these doors obedient people, not disobedient. Speak to us now as only you can. For it's in your son's name that we pray.